No way. This is my CNC milling machine. And this is my wood. Sorry, that was rude of me. It's actually somebody else's wood. More specifically, it's a piece of stabilized maple, meaning it has been soaked in an epoxy solution, then cured to form a wood and resin composite. This should allow me to machine it much more like a plastic, without the common issues you might see when milling regular wood, such as tear off along the grain structure. And wouldn't you know it, this piece of wood is just the right size to make the back shell for a tad boy color, with a bit extra for some related crimes. I'm saving y'all for later. So, let's get into it. The first operation will be to mill out the inside of the shell, for reasons I'll explain on Op 2. Because I have a decent margin of material to work with here, I don't need a high degree of accuracy in holding and locating the part for this operation. I'll just put the workpiece into my vise and pick up the top front left corner with a touch probe, which tells the machine where our part is located so it cuts in the right place. Because the vise provides a lot of clamping force, I start off with an aggressive facing toolpath to both flatten the surface, as well as remove as much excess material as we can before Op 2 where we won't have as much clamping force. Next, I move on to a pair of adaptive clearing tool pads. The first will remove the bulk of the inner material, leaving just a whisper for us to come in later with finishing passes. The second clearing path does the same thing, but on the outside of the part, which I have set up to run almost all the way down to the vice jaws. Clearing is followed up by a few finishing paths using the same flat end mill, which will remove the extra material I left during clearing. Specifically, I run a path to finish all the flat sections, and then run contours along the walls to bring things to the correct dimensions and leave a nice finish. I then switch to a 1 8 inch ball end mill, which has a round cutting edge that can be used to cut curved surfaces, like these inner fillets. A sufficiently large ball can also cut small chamfers, because geometry, so I'll do that as well. Possibly the scariest path involves cleaning up the port cutouts with this much smaller ball end mill, which has a diameter of 1 of an inch, or roughly 0.8 millimeters. The diameter here isn't particularly an issue, but the cutting length of 1 quarter of an inch, which is needed to prevent rubbing of the shoulder on deeper cuts, is much longer than I usually use, which makes it easier to snap. Thankfully this material is relatively soft, and this works out just fine. Finally, I switch to a slightly smaller flat end mill than I used previously, do a final contour on the inner lip, and bore out the screw holes. Now that's a handsome half of a part. So that was relatively painless. The vise held on to our part securely. And if we do a test fit of a front shell, we can see that we've sort of hit the crucial dimensions for all of our mating surfaces. The question now is how we hold on to and locate this part to mill out the other side. In theory, because the sides are flat and parallel to one another, we could just chuck this back into the vise. However, because of how thin these walls are, and being made of a relatively soft material, by the time we got enough clamping force to withstand the cutting forces that this part is going to experience, we would likely end up with a bowed part. This might not be immediately obvious, but as soon as it's removed from the vise, the part will spring back, and any surfaces we've milled flat will take on a sort of dished shape. And if the bend is especially severe, that might actually cause me to mill directly through thin sections, or potentially throw off feature locations farther from where we probe. So how do we get around this? The answer is with a custom fixture. Now, I didn't film myself making this, but allow me to paint you a picture. A chunky man standing in a garage at 1am in nothing but his underpants, spritzing a hot piece of plastic with lubricant to prevent it from getting too hot and melting into goo. Police are still looking for this mysterious thick boy, but at least he left the fixture behind. So how does this work? In short, a negative of the bottom surface of our part has been milled into the surface of the fixture, so that the side we just finished slots securely into it. A small bore has also been milled into the top of the fixture. I can then come in with my 3D touch probe and pick up the exact location of that bore. Because the entire fixture was milled in a single setup, 
we know exactly where that bore is in relation to our part, so we do not need to worry about finding a suitable surface on the part itself to probe. Since this fixture was milled out of a random scrap of acrylic I had laying around, I don't actually know whether or not any of the sides are square with the locating features. So an edge has been milled into one side for me to run a dial test indicator along to make sure that the workpiece itself is square with the movement of the tool head on the CNC mill. Finally, because we need access to the entire top face, we cannot use clamps like this to hold the workpiece into the fixture because the tool would just cut right through them. That's obviously not great. To get around that, I'll temporarily hold the workpiece down with these standard clamps and bore out the holes for the screws to go into. The workpiece will then be fastened directly to the fixture using four M2 screws, and I can safely remove the clamps and complete the milling. If I were milling a shell out of aluminum, for example, or some other soft metal, I would likely want a stronger material for the fixture. Acrylic does not hold threads very well because of how soft it is. So if cutting forces are especially high, the threads may fail, with the end result being the workpiece getting violently separated from the fixture. Again, because this is a soft material, a running theme here, I should be able to get away with this. But I'll take lighter cuts than the previous step regardless, just to be safe. With the part back on the mill, I start again with a facing toolpath, this time taking shallower cuts with a smaller step over. This is followed up with another adaptive clearing toolpath where the bulk of the remaining material is removed. Then it's a few more finishing operations to clean up flat areas, contour the round parts along the edges, and finally I finish up by engraving the obligatory froggo. And just like that we have a fully finished part where absolutely nothing went wrong. Alright, so maybe things didn't go entirely to plan. Remember that comment about acrylic not holding threads that I made earlier? I really shot myself in the foot on that one. Now, I did manage to finish the part with only some minor blemishes using my favorite form of work holding. I love you. But afterward, I did go back to the fixture to bore out holes for heat set M2 inserts so I can get a bit more use out of this. As for the shell, this is obviously not the natural finish right off the mill, as much as I wish it were. This is the result of a lot of sanding and a few coats of oil and wax to get a smooth finish that looks good and feels nice in the hand. And remember those sticks from earlier? Those got turned into the least controversial feature ever, which is the volume wheel. Last but not least, I decided to mill out a cartridge shield from a nice piece of stabilized wood that I had kicking around, one that I felt would complement the shell colors nicely, and I think it turned out all right. So there we have it, a one of a kind, a one of a kind half wood tad boy color. This used the same shell file that I released previously, so you could do this yourself. Just head on over to the GitHub page for the files and get to milling. Thanks for watching.